everyone. Like you heard, my name is Megan Leslie. I'm president and CEO of the World Wildlife Fund Canada, and it is an honor to be here with you today to talk about how Indigenous-led conservation and technology can help us restore forests after wildfires, and how, if we do it strategically, that restoration can help wildlife, the climate, and even help the forest become more resilient to future fires. Now, I know that you already had a land acknowledgement today, but I just want to say that today I'm going to be talking about the lands and waters that are the traditional territory of First Nations, Inuit, and Métis peoples, and they remain home to diverse Indigenous communities today. The water was and remains native land, and that's important for us all to remember in these days of the conference. Okay, so on the next, oh, that's me. I, I'm not tech, I am uh, conservation, so work, uh, you have to work with me. Uh, and another thing about me is that I am an incredible optimist. And that's been a pretty tough position to hold on to lately. I mean, wildfires are burning across Canada. We're watching trees and vegetation disappear. And that also is important habitat for wildlife and it stores carbon, carbon in the roots and stems and soils. And all of that carbon is literally going up in smoke. More than 7. Point million hectares of forests have been burned in Canada already this year. It's the worst fire season that we have ever had. And it's only June. The impacts of this fire season are immense. I mean, Let's start with the impacts on people as surreal images like this of smoky, orangey lit cities were broadcast around the world. Our family and friends were losing their homes and facing an uncertain future. And remember for how for two years we were told to wear masks indoors and the only place where we could go see our friends and loved ones was outdoors. Well, now health officials in some regions are saying that the smoke and particulate matter is so bad outside that it's dangerous to be outdoors. And now we're wearing masks outside. As you can imagine, there are impacts on wildlife too. I mean, like forest fires have always existed. Yes, I know, but many species adapted. What they'll do is they'll run away or maybe they'll burrow under the fires. But the intensity of today's fires are making it hard for them to escape. And there's also impact on climate. As I mentioned, the, the trees and the soils, they hold a huge amount of stored carbon and it's being absorbed by photosynthesis from the atmosphere. But when those fires burn, the carbon is released back into the atmosphere, further amplifying global warming through a positive feedback loop. Why is all of this happening? Well, of course, the list of reasons is long and complex. Of course, we know that wildfires can be a natural part of ecosystem activity. But let me assure you, this frequency and severity is not natural. Forests are more vulnerable to fires than they once were, and it's all connected. Climate change has altered rainfall cycles and created hotter and drier um, conditions in some regions, while milder winters allow new invasive species to thread, creating vast stands of dead trees that act as kindling for wildfires. On top of that, we humans have weakened the resilience of forests to fire because we are managing them principally for yield. Here's some real talk for you. We are prioritizing tree species and density to maximize outputs for the forestry sector. Rows and rows of trees like rows of corn. Trees that grow quickly for wood products. Trees being grown like an agricultural crop. And what's missing in that picture is all of the other plants, the understory, the, the wildflowers Katie. and shrubs and Good. diversity of species. They're not truly forests. Forests are rich and messy and complex, thriving ecosystems. And in many cases, we can't see the forest for the trees because trees are all that we planted. Resilience, wildlife, climate change, they're left out of the equation. We can do better than this and we have to do better than this. So let's talk about what we can do to recover after these terrible fires and also prevent this magnitude of fire from happening again because it's possible to do both at the same time. First, 
we have to do absolutely everything we can to address climate change and avoid the worst of its impacts. This means reducing human-caused greenhouse gas emissions through decarbonization. And since ecosystems store carbon, it means avoiding the release of that carbon from nature by preventing the damage and destruction of carbon-rich ecosystems like our peatlands and forests. We have to protect these places, not only from development, but also protect them from future fires. That means we need to change how we manage forests to promote resilience. And finally, it means increasing the sequestration of carbon in nature by restoring lands that are already converted or damaged. And this is the solution I want to explore with you today because technology has the potential to transform the way we do this work. Let me tell you about the Shepwetmakulu Restoration and Stewardship Society's efforts at Elephant Hill. This is a nearly 200,000 hectare area of their territory near Kamloops, BC, that burned for three months in 2017. The aftermath of the fire left community members reeling. Many of them lost their homes. And as you can see, the surrounding landscapes changed forever with widespread post-fire erosion and landslides that further damaged salmon habitat. Instead of reforesting using that standard approach of modern forestry that prioritizes coniferous trees with higher economic value for logging, the community set their own approach. This is an approach grounded in their own values and indigenous knowledge that prioritizes resilience and biodiversity. It also meant planting deciduous trees, which are more fire resistant. It meant prioritizing planting that rich understory below the canopy. And it meant measuring and monitoring the carbon left in the landscapes and how it's changing over time so that they could validate their approach and attract new investors to their restoration efforts. And this is where technology comes in. Historically, it's been very costly and time consuming to measure carbon in nature, making it very difficult to do a proper before and after assessment. And it's almost impossible to determine the carbon levels in reaction to conservation efforts. So we needed an inexpensive and efficient approach to measuring carbon in nature, one that was also user friendly. So WWF Canada created the Carbon Meets Nature Tech Challenge, a challenge to catalyze tools for nature-based climate solutions. And now, one of the final award recipients is working with the SRSS to validate their efforts. Innovatree Carbon Group Limited has developed a software that relies on LIDAR and machine learning to calculate carbon found in forest biomass. This technology produces information that be, can be scaled down to the individual tree. And this level of information is really important because there is a ton of variability when it comes to carbon sequestration. I mean, picture that messy forest again. Trees, they grow at different rates and even trees that are right beside each other have different levels of shade and moisture. So a more detailed analysis provides a greater level of accuracy and precision. And it can also tell us if these trees are surviving after restoration. Now, while tech is helping to validate and approve our approach to restoration, there are other examples of how it's being deployed to help speed up restoration efforts. Following the Australia bushfires in 2019 and 2020, WWF Australia committed to planting and protecting 2 billion trees by 2030. They're using a number of tactics, including tree planting with drones which works by mapping specific species to their native areas and firing seeds in carbon capsules into the soil. That capsule protects and fertilizes the seed as it grows and then breaks down as the seed strengthens into a seedling. By using drones to plant trees, landscape can, restoration can happen faster and at scale. One drone can plant up to 40,000 seed pods per day. Now you might be wondering, why do we even need to bother with this restoration? Why aren't forests regenerating on their own? Some of us might have learned in school how the heat of a fire opens those conifer uh, cones and the seeds and sides are distributed. Well, in the, some of the fires that we're seeing today, the conditions are so hot that we're seeing the soil and everything, the cones and everything, they're just getting seared and there's nothing left to grow. So reforestation help is needed and tech is being deployed to make it faster, easier, and cheaper. Now there is some dark stuff happening out there, but I have hope 
and I have a lot of it. There are incredible examples out there of how technology developed for one purpose can be adapted to serve a different and yet critical purpose for nature, wildlife, and climate. Technology is a cornerstone of conservation, helping us to scale our impact beyond our wildest dreams. Technology is making conservation better. And as we see in Interior BC, technology with Indigenous knowledge is changing the way we can work to restore nature after these fires burn out. Now, WWF Canada has an incredibly ambitious 10-year plan. We call it Regenerate Canada. By 2030, we'll restore 1 million hectares of lost complex ecosystems. So back to the messiness, complex ecosystem restoration. In addition to restoring lost ecosystems, we'll protect ecosystems that already exist and we'll reduce carbon emissions by 30 million tons by restoring carbon-rich habitats and protecting current carbon stores. Everything we do now is designed to benefit both wildlife and climate because we know that the biodiversity and climate crises are so interconnected that we can't solve one without the other. And luckily, nature is a solution that can address both at the same time. So thank you for joining me here today to hear about the ways that technology is changing conservation. Uh, we have a great video that we created about the final award recipients of our tech challenge. You can watch with that QR code. If you'd like to learn more, we do have a masterclass Thursday at 11 with Angela Kane, the CEO of SRSS and one of our Nature Meets Carbon Tech Challenge winners will be there as well, Sean Rudd. We can talk more deeply about the challenges and the opportunities facing us, and I hope to see you all there. Because each day in Canada and the world over, we're getting closer and closer to an invisible line, one that unlocks a future that is four degrees warmer, a future with the extinction of more than 100 million species. Crossing that line will lead us to an unrecognizable future, a world on fire, flooding, melting, disappearing, an unrecognizable future that we created. But that line is still ahead of us, and there's time to turn back, and you can help. Thank you.